Hello and welcome back to today's video. So recently I was asked the question, how exactly does the method of using a characteristic equation work when solving ordinary differential equations? So for us to use the characteristic equation method, we need to make sure that three conditions are satisfied first. So firstly, we need to make sure that the differential equation is linear. Secondly, we need to make sure that it is homogeneous. So that just means that everything is in terms of the unknown function and derivatives of that unknown function. And thirdly, we need to make sure that there are constant coefficients. Okay, so if we have terms like x squared or sine of x attached to these derivative terms, then quite often you'll be using a different method to solve these problems. So maybe like a sturm leuville problem or a Cauchy-Euler or even a Bessel function. There are many, many different types of problems and equally as many different types of methods to solve these problems. So in this video, we're just going to be having a quick look at the characteristic equation method, how and why that works. So let's start off with a quick example first of all. So let's say I've got the problem, we've got the second derivative of y minus the first derivative of y minus 2y is equal to zero, okay? So we are, of course, assuming that y is some unknown function of x. And so before we approach this problem using the characteristic equation method, we need to make sure, does it satisfy these three conditions? So first of all, is this a linear differential equation? Well, yes, it is quite clearly. So we can tick that one off. Secondly, is it homogeneous? Meaning, is everything just in terms of our unknown function y or in terms of the derivatives of our unknown function and we see yes everything is and as we have a zero on our right hand side here as well that of course will help us identify that this is simply a homogeneous differential equation and now thirdly does this have constant coefficients well yes it does we've got a one over here a minus one and then a minus two as well of course so clearly as it satisfies all three conditions of using the characteristic equation method, that's what we're going to go ahead and use. So let's now dive right in to what this actually implies for us and what this means for our method of approaching this. So we see that simply because we are adding and subtracting all these different terms together and they are somehow equal to zero, that must mean that they are linear combinations of each other. Okay, so what that then implies for us further is that y, the unknown function, has derivatives that are simply multiples of itself. And now there's only one function that realistically works in that regard. And we know that to be the exponential function. So if I have y being equal to e to the, let's say, lambda x, then I would say that y prime, the first derivative there, is gonna simply be equal to lambda e to the lambda x. And then we would say that our second derivative is gonna be equal to lambda squared e to the lambda x. And you can try this with maybe a polynomial. So if we started like x squared and you know plus, minus, whatever, so on and so forth, you would see that you would get different terms that are not going to be multiples of itself. And so that clearly will not work for this differential equation. Now you might be tempted to consider, well, what about sine and cosine? Because they do turn back into multiples of themselves after differentiating twice. So you know that sine goes into cosine, and you know that cosine goes into minus sine. So then you can say, well, the second derivative of sine is a multiple of sine. And then you know that minus sine will go back into minus cosine, and then so on and so forth, just following that loop. And so what we see will happen now is that's not really going to work for this particular type of problem. So firstly, and probably most evidently, is because let's say if y was equal to some multiple of sine, then we would have a sine and a sine, but then this first derivative here would be in terms of cosine. So we know that trigonometric functions will not work for when we're solving this second order linear homogeneous differential equation. Now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna rewrite this problem in terms of these proposed functions for y and y's derivatives. So let's see what this turns into now. So y double prime, we know we rewrite that as lambda squared e to the lambda x minus, well, y prime would now become lambda e to the lambda x minus 2 times y, which is simply e 
to the lambda x, and we say that that is all equal to zero. Okay, so I can now just quickly divide through by e to the lambda x, and let's see what happens then. Then all of a sudden, I'm simply going to be left with lambda squared minus lambda minus two equals to zero. And this is just a straightforward quadratic equation. And so when we solve this, let's just quickly factorize this. So we'll end up with uh, lambda plus one and lambda minus two equal to zero. So then we can say, well, therefore, lambda is going to be equal to minus one and positive two. Okay, so we'll keep those values in mind. Now let's go back and quickly refer to, well, what does the lambda do in this function of y? Well, that's simply up in the index attached to that x there. So what that means we can do now is, well, we can just rewrite our solutions. So we have y was equal to e to the negative 1x, so I'll just write negative x. And then we also had the solution of y was equal to e to the 2x. Okay, and so by the superposition principle, which states that the sum of two solutions is also going to be the solution here. So we're going to go ahead and write our final solution simply as y is equal to e to the negative x plus e to the 2x. And one thing we should note as well is there can be some constants out the front here, so I might just put c1 and c2. These are typically going to be defined by your initial conditions for some ordinary differential equation. Uh, and that really depends on the question, but just make sure that you do write in some constant terms here. They can generally just be any real number. And if you do use this form, you can go through and differentiate this once and then twice, and then substitute those values back into the original differential equation problem. And you'll see that the constants don't change anything. They are just gonna be there in order to determine some initial conditions which you may or may not be given. Excellent. So that's the case when we're working with a second order linear homogeneous ordinary differential equation with two unique real roots. So let's quickly consider another scenario where you'd end up with two complex conjugate roots to this quadratic expression here. It follows through very much the exact same procedure, uh, except you'll just end up using Euler's formula and then be able to rewrite everything in the end in terms of sine and cosine, and of course using the imaginary unit appropriately there. Now the next interesting example, however, will actually come from the situation when we have repeated roots, and I would like to discuss this in a little bit more detail. So let's look at another problem here. So we've got y double prime plus 2y prime plus y equal to zero. Okay, again, we're gonna use the exact same sort of ansatz, which was y is equal to e to the lambda x. And as per above, we get the exact same sort of derivatives here. So we would get lambda e to the lambda x, and then second derivative would become lambda squared e to the lambda x. Okay, again, going through exact same procedure. Let's see what we get. So we get lambda squared e to the lambda x plus 2 lambda e to the lambda x plus e to the lambda x equals 0. Okay, so now we just quickly divide everything by e to the lambda x, and we're left, therefore, with lambda squared plus 2 lambda plus 1 equals 0. And that's just our characteristic equation, similar to what we've seen earlier. So let's quickly factorize this and see what we get. So factorizing this, we'll get that lambda plus one all squared is equal to zero. And that is our solution there. So that means, well, we've got lambda equals negative one as our first solution. And then also lambda equals negative one as our second solution. Okay, so we're not technically wrong in writing it like this. It might be a bit weird and dodgy and unconventional. Uh, but let's consider what this means for our actual function y. So we'd said earlier that y is equal to e to the lambda x. And again, now we know that lambda is equal to minus 1. So we would say e to the minus x. Okay, fantastic. And again, we'd have some constant out the front there, but I won't worry about that too much for now. But then we'll add on our other solution here, which, well, that would be e to the negative x. And so now we come into a bit of a problem here, because these two terms actually do add. And we know that when we're solving a differential equation of second order, you would ideally like to find two different linearly independent solutions. And now the easiest way for us to make sure that these are going to be linearly independent is to simply multiply 
one of these solutions by x. So that way, these are clearly going to be linearly independent. And so we can actually extend this idea to the nth repeated root situation. So let's say you're working with an nth degree ordinary differential equation, and there's n repeated roots. Then let's say we, we find the exact same lambda value, and then our solution would be e to the negative x. And then we'd have brackets. And inside that, we would now have 1 plus x plus x squared plus dot dot dot, so on and so forth, until we get to plus x to the power of n minus 1. Okay, so for n repeated roots, this is what your general solution will be, where obviously instead of just simply negative x, we'll just have that lambda value there. Okay, so there we go. So that's how you would approach these problems with repeated roots with distinct real roots, and also for those complex roots. It's pretty much the exact same sort of procedure. And lastly as well, again, I should mention, we'll chuck some constants in there just to sort of account for any initial conditions. Again, that will just depend on the question that you are given. And that will bring us to the end of today's video. So hopefully this has clarified some things regarding the method of the characteristic equation, particularly when we're using it to solve second order ordinary differential equations, okay? So really always just make sure that before you do it, you make sure that you have it satisfying the three conditions. So firstly, that it's linear. Secondly, that it's homogeneous. Thirdly, that you have constant coefficients. If any of these are not met, then it's gonna require a different method to solve that problem, okay? You can sometimes use this for the inhomogeneous solution, but then you'll also have to come up with the particular solution, and maybe that's something for another video, another day. Anyways, I think I'll wrap it up there. So if you have enjoyed today's video, then please leave a like and consider subscribing if you'd like to see more videos like this. If you have any more questions or comments, then please leave them down below. I'll do my best to read and respond to as many as I can. And as always, I hope you have a great day and stay curious.